Gents and ladies, welcome to the Junior Classics. Hi there, I'm Sir Bradley Hasse, a teller of borrowed tales. Join me as I share stories of courage, adventure, and wonder. But don't take my word for it. You can find out for yourself on today's Junior Classic. Welcome, I am Sir Bradley Hasse, your guide through the Junior Classics. Our purpose is to inspire children and families with a love of good reading and a lasting interest in Western history, literature, and scholarship in order to help build the next generation of leaders. Thank you for joining us each and every week. Remember, my part is to bring the stories, your part is to bring the family. This week we continue our journey with another German tale collected by the Brothers Grimm called Thumbling. But first, our lost and found words. First, a scythe. A scythe is a farming tool used for mowing grass or reaping crops. You may have seen the Grim Reaper holding a scythe in his hand. Secondly, we have a parser, basically a pastor. In pre-Reformation days, a parson was a priest of an independent church. You may have heard of a parsonage. A parsonage is a church-owned home where the parson lives. And lastly, demur. Demur means to object or disagree. And now, on to the show. I want you to imagine you're an officer in command of a flight of German fighter planes during the invasion of Norway. Your fighter is an ME-110, a large twin-engine aircraft. It is heavily armed and armored, but extremely unmaneuverable. This aircraft was selected because it is the only German fighter with the range to reach Norway. Your mission is to protect the transport planes that will drop paratroopers and then landing troops in order to seize an airfield, which is the key to taking the city of Oslo. You are to go up there and drive off the Norwegian fighters so that JU-52s, the transport planes, can drop paratroopers who will take the airfield. Once the airfield is secured, more JU-52s will land on the runway and discharge landing troops who will form up and march into Oslo. You're up there. You dogfight with the Norwegians. You lose a couple planes. They lose a couple planes. But you drive them off. You're almost on the verge of going bingo, which means you're almost out of fuel to get home when you see the JU-52s coming. And then to your horror, they go into the landing pattern. It's not the paratroopers. It's the planes meant to land on the runway. For some reason, they think the airfield has been secured and they are safe to land. If they attempt to land, they are going to get slaughtered. What do you do? This is a true story for World War II. A quick-minded and clever lieutenant landed his heavily armed and armored plane on the airfield pointed his heavy nose guns to the enemy positions, and hosed them. In order to solve the problem, he turned his fighter plane into a tank and saved the landing troops from being destroyed, and thus saved the mission. You may find yourself in a position where you are trying to defeat an opponent in sports, games, competitions, and even combat. You may be smaller, weaker, or not as skilled as the person you are trying to win against. Your mind is your most powerful tool and weapon. Your ability to be creative and solve problems can help you overcome situations when you find yourself outmatched or entirely unprepared. But it can also get you into trouble if you don't apply wisdom to your decision making. In our story today, the main character is not a daring German military officer, but a young child who is quite small. In fact, he is the size of your thumb. That's right your thumb. He is very short, but quite smart, and he doesn't always think about how his quick decisions, which seem clever at the time, may get him into trouble down the road. Our story today is called Thumbling, collected by the Brothers Grimm. Thumbling by William and Jacob Grimm. Once upon a time, there lived a poor peasant, who used to sit every evening by the hearth, poking the fire, while his wife spun. One night he said, 
How sad it is that we have no children. Everything is so quiet here, while in other houses it is so noisy and merry. Ah, if we had but only one, and were he no bigger than my thumb, I should still be content and love him with all my heart. A little while after the wife fell ill, and after seven months a child was born, who, although he was perfectly formed in all his limbs, was not actually bigger than one's thumb. So they said to one another that it had happened just as they wished, and they called the child Thumbling. Every day they gave him all the food he could eat. Still, he did not grow a bit, but remained exactly the height he was when first born. He looked about him, however, very knowingly, and showed himself to be a bold and clever fellow, who prospered in everything he undertook. One morning, the peasant was making ready to go into the forest to fell wood, and said, Now, I wish I had someone who could follow me with the cart. Oh, father, exclaimed Thumbling, I will bring the cart. Don't you trouble yourself. It shall be there at the right time. The father laughed at his speech and said, How shall that be? You are much too small to lead the horse by the bridle. That matters not, father. If mother will harness the horse, I can sit in his car and tell him which way to take. Well, we will try for once, said the father. And so, when the hour came, the mother harnessed the horse and placed Thumbling in its ear and told him how to guide it. Then he set out quite like a man, and the cart went on the right road to the forest. And just as it turned a corner, and Thumbling called out, Steady! Steady! Two strange men met it, and one said to the other, My goodness, what is this? Here comes a cart, and the driver keeps calling to the horse, but I can see no one. That cannot be right, said the other. Let us follow and see where the cart stops. The cart went on safely deep into the forest, and straight to the place where the wood was cut. As soon as Thumbling saw his father, he called to him, Here, father, here I am, you see, with the cart. Just take me down. The peasant caught the bridle of the horse with his left hand, and with his right took his little son out of its ear, and sat himself down merrily on a straw. When the two strangers saw the little fellow, they knew not what to say for astonishment, and one of them took his companion aside and said, This little fellow might make our fortune if we could exhibit him in the towns. Let us buy him. They went up to the peasant and asked, Will you sell your son? We will treat him well. No, replied the man. He is my heart's delight, and not to be bought for all the money in the world. But Thumbling, when he heard what was said, climbed up by his father's skirt, and set himself on his shoulder, and whispered in his ear, Let me go now, and I will soon come back again. So his father gave him to the two men for a fine piece of gold, and they asked him where he would sit. Oh, replied he, put me on the rim of your hat, and then I can walk round and survey the country. I will not fall off. They did as he wished, and when he had taken leave of his father, they set out. Just as it was getting dark, he asked to be lifted down, and, after some demure, the man on whose hat he was took him off and placed him on the ground. In an instant Thumbling ran off and crept into a mouse hole, where they could not see him. "'Good evening, masters,' said he. "'You can go home without me.' And with a quiet laugh he crept into his hole still further. The two men poked their sticks into the hole, but all in vain, for Thumbling only went down further. And when it had grown quite dark, they were obliged to return home full of vexation and with empty pockets. As soon as Thumbling perceived that they were off, he crawled out of his hiding place and said, How dangerous it is to walk in this field in the dark. One might soon break one's head or legs. And so saying, he looked around, and by great luck, saw an empty snail shell. God be praised, he exclaimed. Here, I can sleep securely. And in he went. Just as he was about to fall asleep, he heard two men coming by, one of whom said to the other, 
How shall we manage to get at that parson's gold and silver? That I can tell you, interrupted Thumbling. What, what was that? exclaimed the thief, frightened. I, I heard someone speak. They stood still and listened. And then Thumbling said, Take me with you. I will help you. Where, where are you? asked the thieves. Search on the ground and mark where my voice comes from, replied he. The thief looked about and at last found him and lifted him up in the air. What, you will help us, you little white, said they. Do you not see I can creep between the iron bars into the chamber of the parson and reach out to whatever you require? Very well, we will see what you can do, said the thief. When they came to the house, Thumbling crept into the chamber and cried out with all his might, Will you have all that is here? The thieves were terrified and said, Speak gently, or someone will awake. But Thumbling feigned not to understand, and exclaimed louder still, Will you have all that is here? This awoke the cook, who slept in the room, and sitting up in her bed she listened. The thieves, however, had run back a little way, quite frightened. But taking courage again, and thinking the little fellow wished to tease them, they came and whispered to him to make haste and hand them out something. At this, Thumbling cried out still more loudly, I will give you it all. Only put your hands in. The listening maid heard this clearly, and springing out of bed, hurried out at the door. The thieves ran off as if they were pursued by the wild huntsmen, but the maid, as she could see nothing, went to strike a light. When she returned, Thumbling escaped without being seen into the barn, and the maid, after she had looked round and searched in every corner without finding anything, went to bed again, believing she had been dreaming with her eyes open. Meanwhile, Thumbling had crept in amongst the hay and found a beautiful place to sleep, where he intended to rest till daybreak, and then to go home to his parents. Other things, however, was he to experience, for there is much tribulation and trouble going on in this world. The maid got up at dawn of day to feed the cow. Her first walk was to the barn, where she took an armful of hay and just the bundle where poor Thumbling lay asleep. He slept so soundly, however, that he was not conscious, and only awoke when he was in the cow's mouth. "'Ah, goodness!' exclaimed he. "'However came I into this mill?' But soon he saw where he really was. Then he took care not to come between the teeth, but presently slipped quite down the cow's throat. "'There are no windows in this room,' said he to himself, "'and no sunshine, and I brought no light with me.' Overhead his quarters seemed still worse, and more than all, he felt his room growing narrower, as the cow swallowed more hay. So he began to call out in terror as loudly as he could, "'Bring me no more food! I do not want any more food!' Just then the maid was milking the cow, and when she heard the voice without seeing anything, and knew it was the same she had listened to in the night, she was so frightened that she slipped off her stool and overturned the milk. In great haste, she ran to her master, saying, Oh, Mr. Parson, the cow has been speaking. You are crazy, he replied. But still, he went himself into the stable to see what was the matter. And scarcely had he stepped in when Thumbling began to shout out again, Bring me no more food! Bring me no more food! This terrified the parson himself and he thought an evil spirit had entered into his cow, and so ordered her to be killed. As soon as that was done, and they were dividing the carcass, a fresh accident befell Thumbling, for a wolf, who was passing at the time, made a snatch at the cow, and tore away the part where he was stuck fast. However, he did not lose courage, but as soon as the wolf had swallowed him, he called out from inside, "'Oh, Mr. Wolf!' I know of a capital meal for you. Where is it to be found? asked the wolf. In the house by the meadow, you must creep through the gutter, and there you will find cakes and bacon and sausages, as many as you can eat, 
replied Thumbling, describing exactly his father's house. The wolf did not wait to be told twice, but in the night crept in and ate away in the larder to his heart's content. When he had finished, he tried to escape by the way he entered, but the hole was not large enough. Thereupon Thumbling, who had reckoned on this, began to make a tremendous noise inside the poor wolf, screaming and shouting as long as you could. "'Will you be quiet?' said the wolf. "'You will awake the people.' "'Eh, what?' cried the little man. "'Since you have satisfied yourself, it is my turn now to make merry.' And he set up a louder howling than before. At last his father and mother awoke, and came to the room, and looked through the chinks of the door, and as soon as they perceived the ravages the wolf had committed, they ran and brought the man his axe, and the woman the sieve. "'Stop you behind,' said the man, as they entered the room. "'If my blow does not kill him, you must give him a cut with your weapon, and chop off his head if you can.' When Thumbling heard his father's voice, he called out, "'Father dear, I am here, in the wolf's body.' "'Heaven be praised,' said the man, full of joy. "'Our dear child is found again.' And he bade his wife take away the sieve, lest it should do any harm to his son. Then he raised his axe, and gave the wolf such a blow on its head that it fell dead. And, taking a knife, he cut it open and released the little fellow his son. "'Ah,' said his father, "'what trouble we have had about you.' "'Yes, father,' replied Thumbling, I have been traveling a great deal about the world. Heaven be praised. I breathe fresh air again. Where have you been, my son? He inquired. Once I was in a mouse's hole, once inside a cow, and lastly inside that wolf. And now I will stop here with you, said Thumbling. Yes, said the old people. We will not sell you again for all the riches of the world. And they embraced and kissed him with great affection. Then they gave him plenty to eat and drink, and had new clothes made for him, for his old ones were worn out with traveling. The End The lesson of the story today is it sure pays to be clever, and quick decision-making can be very helpful. But you must use wisdom when making choices, so you don't end up in trouble you didn't see coming. Wisdom is using your mind to judge or decide what is most just, proper, and useful. Always remember, junior scholars, you have not been given a spirit of fear, but one of love, power, and sound judgment. I am Sir Bradley Hassey. Until next time, be brave, be loyal, and speak the truth. Now for you parents out there, I want you to understand why we are doing this, what we are trying to achieve, and how you can help us. This is a rescue operation to preserve the classics in the wisdom within before it is lost forever. Our goal is to inspire children with a love of good reading by safeguarding and breathing new life into the greatest stories in history and empower you, the parents, with a resource you can trust to enrich your child's mind and spirit. We don't want these stories in the wisdom within to be forgotten so our children don't have to learn these lessons on their own. The most important thing you can do for us is to spread the message and tell others about these stories and what we are doing. If you want to donate, we would love that as well. My promise is that 100% of donations will go to building the impact and quality of the Junior Classics. If you have feedback and thoughts on how we can do things better, please send an email to thejuniorclassics at gmail.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the show and leave us a review and rating. Five stars if you think it is worth it. Thank you for listening.